So let's start the session officially. Uh, so as you know, this uh, session is about management of uh, prevention and management of postpartum hemorrhage, the latest guideline which came out in 2023 by the RCPI. Uh, and um, though I am a mentor of MRCOG as well, but uh, MRCPI is the one I started uh, doing the sessions with and uh, alhamdulillah so far we have a success rate of 100% with our OSCE courses. Um, so let's go to the MRCPI OSCE. What is the MRCPI exactly all about? So of course welcome to the session. Thanks for joining in, sparing your time and uh, joining us for this session. Um, so, you know, uh, MRCPI, it is uh, an internationally recognized qualification and it is accredited by the Medical Council of the Ireland as the foremost knowledge-based assessment of Ops and Gynae. What it means by the foremost knowledge-based assessment, it means that you this is a basic speciality training program, okay? So once you pass your MRCPI, then you're eligible to enter for the higher specialist training in the Ireland, um, which is the final stage of training before you are allowed to work independently as a specialist or a consultant. Okay, so this uh, qualification is recognized by the GMC, that is the General Medical Council of UK. So if you have MRCPI, you can get your registration, GMC registration in UK, and you are allowed to practice in UK as well. So uh, the part two OSCE clinical examination, it is all about your knowledge and understanding of the ob as well as your problem-solving skills, your diagnosis, what investigations you need to do in any case, and what about the clinical situation and your communication skills. Uh, it is a gateway to progressing a higher specialty training and ultimately a career in the hospital medicine. So this exam of uh, OSCE and MRCPI, which is uh, Objective Structured Clinical Examination, it has seven stations, which are each station is for 10 minutes. And in this st seven stations, there is one rest station. So you will be in the exam for about 80 minutes, but the 10 minutes, one station will be a resting station where you will not be doing anything. You will just sit and relax yourself. Okay. And this is, there is a one long case, which can either be a gynae case or obstetric case. And you have 25 minutes to perform that task, which is the <clears throat> long case and you are observed fully observed means all the time there will be two examiners who will be sitting uh, at uh, you know at the back of the patient and they will be observing you so if you are taking a history and you forget something so don't create anything from your side if you have forgotten something and the examiner is asking about it so just say sorry i forgot to ask because if you forget and if you lie, that gives you a very bad impression and they will fail you. So make sure that whatever, first you have to practice your history very well. You have a lot of time in this long case to do your history thing. So do your history, practice your history. And if at all you forget anything and the, you know it comes later that you should have asked, you did not ask, just acknowledge that, sorry, I forgot to ask. Yes, it's relevant in this case. Okay, any questions so far? Dr. Ozma, it is seven station or it is six plus one? You mean six station real and one rest? No, no, no. It is seven station plus one rest. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah, anything else? Anyone want to ask anything? All right. So the clinical component is a simulated uh, uh, thing. The patient is not a real patient. Uh, the exam is not based in the hospital any uh, because after the COVID things change. So it will be some other place where the exam will be conducted. Maybe it is next to a hospital, but the patient will be a simulated patient. It will not be a real patient. So don't get surprised if you see certain information outside and you see something different in front of you. It means uh, like patients age certain 70 years and you see a young female sitting in front of you. So, you know, it is just a simulated thing but you have to act according to whatever information is provided to you, okay? Not what is sitting in front of you, all right? So as I said, the long case can be either a gynae case or an obstetric case. You will be fully examined by a pair of examiners. 
One will be, you know, asking cases about your history taking and the examination part. Other examiner will in, uh, ask you about your diagnosis and how you will manage the case. In between, uh, it depends on how things are going. Uh, sometimes the uh, role player part finishes once you are done with your history taking and examination. Examination is not on the patient, it is on the mannequin. So, uh, you know, there was an exam where there was a case of endometriosis and once the uh, student, they he touched the mannequin in the lower abdomen, the role player made us uh, sound. So it can be like this to imitate something to give you a diagnosis. Like maybe she wanted to say that she's tender in the lower abdomen. So it can be a pelvic inflammatory disease or endometriosis. So, you know, it can happen. But once I gave my exam, after I'm done with the history and the examination part, there was no communication with the uh, role player. So they are just judging uh, you on how you are communicating with the patient, how you are taking the history. What is your tone? Is there any, enough sympathy and empathy in your tone? If the patient says that the parents are like my uh, family, you ask about the family history and they will tell, okay, my parents, they passed away. So don't just move on to the next question. Just, oh, I'm sorry, how you're coping with the loss? You know, things like that. So these all things, they matter a lot in this examination. In any examination, be it EPCOG or RCOG or RCPI, your empathy and sympathy, your tone, and your uh, words with your body language, everything matters in these exams, okay? All right, so this is your passing rate. Uh, as you can see that for 20, uh, 2022, uh, the trainees who were Irish trainees, they passed a number of the percentage of the people who passed in first attempt was 78%. And overall percentage was 71%. Irish graduates, again, 77% and 81%. International graduates who passed the written, this is for the written exam, okay? So international graduates who passed in the first attempt was 53%. It is not that great at all. And overall, it was 52%, okay? So the number of uh, people passing the written exam is low as compared to the people who passed the OSCE exam. For me, I feel MRCPI is very doable exam. You just have to know your topics. And because of the OSCE stations, uh, there is one another uh, patient interaction station. Otherwise, it's all your knowledge-based exam. So if you have passed your written exam, that means you already have the knowledge. Now you just have to apply that knowledge. So it's easier compared to any other exam to pass MRCPI OSCE exam. Okay, so as you can see here, the people who are trained in Ireland, the Irish trainees, they have a 100% passing rate, okay, in the first attempt. While the international graduates, they also have a very high risk rate of passing, that is 82%, okay. So it's a very doable exam. And if you have done your part two uh, written uh, with, you know, good, uh, this one, knowledge and prepare, preparation, then you are all set to pass the OSCE exam. Okay, so next OSCE exam will take place on November, 11th November in Ireland and 11th and 12th November in the UAE. And the applications will open on 27th September. The reply you will receive from the college will only come after four weeks, uh, after the uh, this one closing date. So in, once the date is closed for the exam uh, application, then you will start receiving your uh, approval or you found a place or you didn't get a place. Sometimes till the end, they are, you know, offering places. So don't think that in the beginning, if you didn't get a place, that you will not find a place in for the November exam itself. Uh, I've seen people who are offered a place in the exam, maybe a week before the exam date or two weeks before the exam date. So just keep emailing the college to keep, you know, to show your interest in the exam. And they normally entertain people because sometimes there are people who just back out from the exam, who cancel the exam. So there is a seat available. So, you know, keep emailing the college if you are not uh, able to, you didn't get a seat in this November exam and you want to sit for the November exam. Okay. So can we have someone 
people who can will volunteer to perform this task. Anybody, please? Can I try to Dr. Esma, please? Yes, yes, sure, sure. Wait. Okay, before we start the task, uh, any questions? No questions. Okay. So uh, this is like an OSCE st uh, station we are doing. Okay, doctor? Yeah. So you have 10 minutes total. And your 10 minutes will be, uh, you know, included in the reading time. For the OSCE, the station, it is like that, that uh, one after the other, you have to move for the OSCE stations. Okay. So the two minutes in between uh, one is two stations it is not your reading time. It is just standing there. It is for the examiner to give the marks to the previous candidate. Okay. So yeah. you will see the station in front of you and your time will start from there. Okay. Dr. Osma, just I want to ask you. It's like I'm RCOG, the station outside the queue. No, no, no. Or it's inside. It is inside. It is inside. It is on the table because I don't know where you will give uh, go for the exam. I gave the exam in UAE. So, you know, there were like, it was a corridor where there were different desks, one after the other, with some distance in between them. And mm -hmm. this uh, task was lying on that desk in front of the examiner. So yeah. you finish your one task, the bell rings, you start your station, then the bell rings, you just go in the waiting line, okay? That two minutes is there, then you go to the next station. So that two minutes which you are waiting, it's not your reading time. You don't have anything to do at that time. You just have to wait for the next task to begin. Okay. Your task you will only see once you will sit on that desk. Okay. Okay. So yeah. it's a normally a small task. It's not, you know, like RCOG where they are putting five, six, eight papers outside. So it's normally a small task you will see and immediately it will the station will start. And normally you are always able to, you know, finish your task within 10 minutes. Um, there is not much in that task. So I don't, for me, each task was finished before the time was finished. Maybe eight minutes, seven minutes like that. Then they start talking to you about social things. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So once we are done with this station, then we will discuss the guideline which came in 2023. All right, doctor, your time starts now. I will just put a timer for you. So it is a, it is a structured discussion, Dr. Raj. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm, 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 I'm one of the candidates for the exams. I read the instruction and I'm ready for the discussion. Okay, doctor. So what will be your immediate management? So first, I will rush to the labor room, whatever there is an emergency, and and then the uh, so it's emergency. So buzz the, the uh, I mean uh, call for help in such conditions when the patient, uh, and then is is all the teamwork. It will be it will be teamwork in the form of uh, the, probably the, not only they call me also, or I will call. So the rest of uh, people like um, uh, coordinator, midwife, and the uh, and is the um, uh, porter, hematologist, all these, it's, they will be called uh, during the emergency uh, conditions. And I will start, uh, uh, this is first I start communication and the second half point, I will start resuscitations all as a teamwork of resuscitations and I uh, will try to arrest and find the cause of the bleeding. So, so it is an emergency, a set of emergency conditions. Uh, so in such conditions, when I will, uh, I will just, I, will, I want to check what is the indications for forceps delivery. And um, uh, it's just a brief history from the midwife or the person who uh, present in the labor room. If the patient's in the epidural or uh, not, if the patient's part of the patient, indication of the forceps, maybe conditions good, is placenta deliver or not, and then we'll start immediate resuscitations. So, resuscitations will start by um, ABC, 
Minova, ABC, I mean. Uh, so its airway is uh, give high um, oxygen flow. And uh, for um, uh, B, it will be start by two IV cannula, white board half house cannula on both sides, which will then is by then is it is or the midwife for cross match CBC um, coagulation blood group, uh, renal liver function test and calculation, as I mentioned, and they start immediately rush of the fluid. So uh, uh, for me, uh, as a, as a uh, um, obstetrician, so I would put my hand on the u uterus. Suppose the placenta is delivered completely and they put my hand in the uh, uterus, just I will check if it's uh, uterus contracted or not. And then if it's uterus is contracted, though, they immediately will shift the patient to the theater because she has forced delivery. So if it's contracted, mean there is no atonia. And uh, usually they put IV fluid by in the form of a crystalloid and will uh, um, uh, probably will check if they give any uterotonic uh, medication. Um, uh, and also put foliscatar just also to check urine output and if there is any blood in the catheter. Uh, and also it's, it's, it's help in case of maneuver of, uh, uh, I mean, assessment of the uterine contraction. I will shift here to the theater. Usually the is there, uh, theater informed, consultant is informed that the patient is uterus, probably if there is a placenta complete, so no retainer product. If the uterus contracted, so it's not atony. If it's atony, I deal with the atony. If it's not atony, then I will shift here to the theater for uh, for uh, to find the cause of bleeding for that traumatic delivery. Okay, so how you will manage your trine atony? So if it's uterine atony, as I mentioned, it's, they will start immediately by give uh, uh, IV uh, oxytocin, so first bolus dose and then infusion. But if there is no contraindication to the methargine, also they will give a methargine injection. If there is, uh, after that, if there is still, uh, will give mesoprostol also, either rectally or will go subclinical. According to the protocol and guideline, and also if it's uh, still, then we can give uh, also injection of the prostaglandin F2 alpha and repeat the dose according to the uh, protocol. And also a uh, tranexamic acid usually well given by the, by the uh, anesthetist. This is in case of uterotonic drugs. And so also IV fluids is running until the blood and the blood product is coming. All right. Can you tell me the doses you will give for each the med of the drug you may give? Yeah, so uh, for oxytocin, usually we'll give uh, 10 units um, first and then followed by 40 units uh, infusions. Uh, and for the methylgene, I will give 0.25 uh, milligrams and I can repeat the dose up to, I think, four. And for the oxytocin, usually I give half some 800 micrograms, we'll give in either rectally or subunit ones. And for prostaglandin F2 alpha, I will give uh, 250 micrograms and I repeat it after 15 minutes up to two milligram. I think two, two, yeah, to two milligram. I mean, six times, uh, eight times I can repeat the dose of prostaglandin F2 alpha. Whether it's because the patient is still, um, uh, I mean, is not open the protomy, so I giving I can give an IM. Even the intra uterine can be given, but we usually will give IM. Tranexamic usually is given one gram injection and usually given by anesthetist. All right. So if the patient is still is having your trinatoni, what is your next plan of management? Yeah. If, if it's atony, so I will shift here to the theater. Still, after all, oxytocin drug will shift here to the theater for the uh, battery balloon. And usually, if it's okay, if everything is conditions in the battery balloon, uh, I mean, when I inflate the battery balloon, there is less bleeding. So after that, uh, I will uh, shift here to the high dependence unit for uh, close monitoring, immune chart, uh, how much input, how much output, vital sign, conscious level, all these. Uh, conditions. This is in case of uterine atony. If no response to the Becquery balloon, so I, uh, with the presence of the consultant on all team, so uh, and it will lead to the laparotomy. In such condition, laparotomy, we have different approach of the laparotomy. And in the theater also, when I shift to the theater, I, before I put Becquery balloon, I should check if there is a concomitant with it or only cause that. If there is a bleeding, if there is um, trauma, and extension of trauma, what is that trauma, whether in this uterus, in the cervix, in the in the vulva, whatever, or it may be rectal trauma from uh, forceps delivery with the bleeding, I will check before I uh, introduce a uh, battery balloon for atony. 
Uh, How much fluid you will use to inflate the bakery balloon? Uh, usually, if uh, according it is, I think it the, if there is range, but 300 cc could be suitable. I will inflate, I think, till 500 cc, was mostly it's 300 cc. Because I will check during inflation. If it's uh, stop bleeding will be less, it's okay. All right. How long you will keep the bakery balloon? Yeah, usually we'll keep it as uh, some according uh, to the hospital protocol, 24 to 24 hours, could be 12 hours, 24 hours, when the patient's stable condition and the bleeding is less, then gradually we deflate the bakery balloon. Okay. Suppose the patient is still bleeding with the bakery balloon. So what is your next plan of management? So it's actually to go to the laboratory in the presence of all the staff and um, uh, usually uh, for such conditions when open uh, for the laboratory, we have different approach for that. Uh, we could use the bilange technique or we could use stepwise devascularizations according to the facility. So, Okay, so what you will do after you have dealt with the postpartum hemorrhage? What are the things you need to address? Yeah, so I need to address also that uh, the incidents report. Um, uh, I will at first is I will document all the uh, incidents and uh, debrief patients and family later on, and also will uh, uh, drill after that of uh, team work and also DATICS, which is incidents report. I should write uh, as I told you also with all chart of NEOS chart there is incidents report. All right, okay. So how you will prevent this from happening? Yeah, so for this case, or it's general, it could be general, right? A prevention of uh, postpartum hemorrhage, or for this case, doctor, you mean? For no, no, I'm talking in general, postpartum hemorrhage, how can you yeah. prevent? Yeah, so to reduce the incidence of postpartum is, is to identify high-risk group of high-risk group, like for patients with for inertia, more liable for inertia, or more, for more liable for trauma. Uh, during antenatal care, identify the high-risk group and also correct of uh, hemoglobin for patients who cannot um, uh, correct hemoglobin to reach normal level, for patients who cannot, uh, a high-risk group, and they are refused blood transfusion, such conditions may be shift to the high high uh, tertiary centers like Juha Botnes and other uh, people. For patients with uh, high risk of atony, so it will be, should be active management of third stage of the labor. Also, cannula should be put in during labor, and should uh, it could be uh, just a, a, a group and safe in such conditions uh, when there's expected uh, bleeding on happen. In uh, such patients, um, I should ask what is the indication for forceps? Is there is any uh, prolonged labor or difficulty in the first or second stage of labor? I mean a prolonged. So forceps should be done by more experienced person. It could be done in the theater, in the presence of all the staff from the anesthetist and of more senior uh, people. And um, the, I mean experienced persons and proper indication for forceps delivery. Okay, what are the highest group who can have postpartum hemorrhage? Yeah, it could be if you take from simple things is age increase, age parity, also high parity, especially grand multi parity, like patient with the bleeding ABH during a pregnancy, whether it's a rupture or with a placenta breva by itself, even for uh, mostly they will go for cesarean section, but it's risk factor also for PPH, over distended uterus, whatever, like a twin uh, fibroid, maybe in, inside the uterus. Uh, Okay, your time finished, Dr. B. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bosman. All right. Thank you very much. Ex uh, excellent performance. And you passed the station with flying clears. Very, very good. Um, thanks, okay. Dr. Very well done, doctor. So I don't have anything to actually, you know, uh, suggest you covered almost everything. Just uh, one thing I want to highlight what is your immediate management? You said, yes, it is an emergency situation. That is very right. Uh, but you did not, you oh. know, speak with the patient at any time during the station. So right? can you repeat, Doctor? You did not involve the patient. You did not speak to the patient. Yeah, at right. All yeah. these 10 yeah. minutes, you did not speak to the patient at all or yeah. the family. Yeah, you are right. But I say okay. I will debrief later. You are right. If it's conscious, yeah, we should tell her. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. This brief comes later. Yeah. But once you are going for emergency situation, you will what you will do, you will go to the patient, introduce yourself, explain to her that this is emergency situation. We are having a uh, extra bleeding. So I will just we'll start managing, and then quickly you will take a history from the midwife about what happened. If there was a tear, if it is a stitch, not stitch, and you will ask her about the vital signs of the patient. Okay. Yeah. This is first, this is what you do in your natural yeah, regular yeah. life also, right? You don't yeah. jump to calling here and there before you see the patient, before you establish that maybe you don't need to call anyone. You just have to uh, suture a simple tear, which is bleeding from the vagina, right? Correct. Yeah, correct. It may be not. So much just bleeding. bring the common things first and then we speak about the things that can happen. That can be a cause of bleeding. Okay, so yeah. Yeah. All right. Could be minor. For me, I went to major. It could be minor BPH. Yeah. 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 It can be minor PPH. It can be patient is uh, already she's anemic patient and with minor PPH she is you know uh, collapsing. So there are so many things. So you need to address the patient. Take a quick history from the midwife and see. Ask about what happened actually. What is the size of the baby? How is the baby is taken care of? by the neurologist or no okay yes. any comments about uh, this uh, from anyone we have Fatima Dr. Zahir Dr. GM Fazil some iPhone user Mahtoum so many people are here nobody want to say anything Or if anybody has any question, please open your mic. Allergy. Uh, that allergy, that is, uh, she already mentioned that if she will not give uh, methargin if the patient is hypertensive. She mentioned that, and yes, you have to speak. I will exclude allergies uh, before giving the, any drug to the patient. That is correct. Any more any comments from anyone? All right. So nobody want to comment. But anyways, it was a great performance. Very well done. Okay. So you see uh, what are the key recommendations from the latest guideline? Uh, preparedness. Preparedness means... Uh, as doctor said that this should you should be aware of the patients who are at risk of having a postpartum hemorrhage and identify them in the antenatal period okay so they should be actively managed in each care opportunity this should include screening and management for antenatal anemias and recognize risk factors so there was, you know, uh, there was uh, just a little more uh, um, question which was remaining about the high risk group. Uh, she started with the answer, but the time finished, unfortunately. Okay, let me see what are the comments. Forceps delivery suspected trauma of cervix. Yes, very good. It can be combined. You are very right. Okay, so in the antenatal period, uh, what which patients are at risk of having a PPH? Uh, anybody else can just open their ma uh, mic and speak, please. Please feel free to talk. Come on, don't be shy. Past history of PPH. Sorry. Yeah, very good. Excellent. Yeah. What else? There are so many other factors like a multiple pregnancy or a... polyhydramnios macrosomia. Exactly. Very good. Yes. What else? And uh, if the patient is... Uh... Eclampsia, preeclampsia. Yes. Yes. Very good. These are all risk factors. Okay. So Any as you said... Uh, so the 
patient identification is very important in the antenatal period so that you make the arrangements accordingly. Maybe you are working in a secondary uh, uh, level care and this patient needs tertiary care services. So you have to arrange transfer of this patient in the antenatal period, right? So like, like this patient is a case of placenta previa and she is a Javoha witness. So how you will manage her with you? It's not possible. So antenatally, you have to arrange patients transfer to a tertiary care unit. So that's why identification of these patients in the antenatal period is very, very important. Okay, agreed? Yes, Dr. Yes. Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay, so as the guideline says that these are patients who do not wish to receive the blood products, then this is also which type of products they don't accept. Some people accept the, uh, not the red cells, but they accept the plasma and the platelet. So maybe you have to, you know, give them details. that Okay, which products you will accept, which products you won't. And then you have to involve your, you know, you have to make an advanced decision. Suppose this patient starts to bleed and she strictly said, don't give me any blood products. And this can lead to death of the patient. So you have to make an advanced decision in such cases and in, involve the specified medical treatments and the teams in the hospital. Maybe uh, you need to involve the administration and the people the, the who are dealing with the social services and the lawyer of the hospital that this can be a situation. And in that case, what to do? Because you should not be penalized for something the patient has already wished for. Okay. All right. So the team management will be very important so that referral of the patient during uh, antenatal period and the postpartum care like a fetal maternal specialist, hematologist and anesthetist. It will be a team management. The women should have a full blood count at booking then repeated at 28 weeks. Those who have anemia, please correct their anemias. Okay, maybe in the form of uh, oral iron, IV iron or blood transfusion. The placental site should be determined by the uh, 20 week scan. And if it shows a low lying placenta, then you have to repeat the scan at 32 weeks to confirm if the patient will have a normal delivery or she will need a cesarean section according to the placental localization. And if there is placenta accreta, of course, it will be a planned delivery. It will be before term. I don't let the patient go into labor with placenta accreta. It will be a disaster for everyone. So as we said earlier, risk factors should be identified in the uh, antenatal period and intrapartum period. So intrapartum period, what are the risk factors that can lead to a postpartum hemorrhage? Anybody? If we are doing a cesarean section under general anesthesia. Uh, yeah, that is cesarean section. What about normal delivery? Yeah, good to be prolonged labor. Yes, what else? What was the scenario about? Which delivery was there? Yeah, instrumental. Very good. And precipitate labor. Prolonged rupture of membranes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yes, induction, augmentation. So these all things, they are, chorea, that is PPROM leading to chorioamnonitis. These all are risk factors of having a PPH. So this, you are all, and then good size baby, right? Uncontrolled diabetes, good size baby. These all things, they are, uh, patient is prone to have a postpartum hemorrhage. So these all things, you will be aware and you will be vigilant in these patients. Okay, so manage them accordingly. Yeah, very advanced maternal age also. Uh, multiple births, multigravida, they also have above three, they are likely to have increased bleeding. Okay. So as per this guideline, all obstetric units, they should have a supply of the RH negative, RD, uh, Kel negative blood for emergency use. They should have a, a policy and protocol in place. Okay. And uh, this policy and protocol means there should be a, what is given what should be done whenever you see a patient with postpartum hemorrhage? So it should be a proper policy 
protocol. There should be documentation, standards, which standards the hospital is following and what are you should be, you know, have people allocated and they should be responsible for certain tasks, okay? Blood components should be available, pharmaceutical location, availability, porters, all these things should be in place before you start taking patients who are at risk of postpartum hemorrhage. And each maternity unit should identify and document the turnaround times for the lab results relevant to the management of massive obstetric hemorrhage. So many hospitals, they have a, a code where they will just activate the code of massive obstetric hemorrhage. So that means everybody in that team, they are aware that they are having a, a massive obstetric hemorrhage and suppose labor room or uh, OT. And, you know, each person will already have a task allocated to them and they will do the needful, whatever their task is. Okay, got my point? Okay. Then local simulated multidisciplinary team, like a drill, should also be there in each hospital to promote uh, this kind of... Uh, please uh, keep your mics muted, uh, because there's a lot of background noise. Mic is on. Please mute yourself. Mike is on. Can we mute from our side because I don't know. All right. Anyway. Please keep your mics muted. Doctor, I think Dr. Belush, she, her mic or his mic open. Oh, no, it's okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right, because there was so much of background noise, I cannot, you know, hear anyone. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, as we were talking about the multidisciplinary <clears throat> drills at specific periodic basis and uh, e-learning courses for the staff, uh, it should be there. Uh, how many of you work in places where they have such drills? You can write on the chat box. No one? Okay, fortunately, I'm working in a place where we have uh, regular drills of uh, dealing with the shoulder dystocia, postpartum hemorrhage, and uh, how to take a patient for code blue. So we all are, you know, whenever there's a real life scenario, we are already prepared for it. So this makes a lot of difference once the you are doing regular drills for such scenarios, for especially obstetric emergencies, okay? So appropriately trained colleagues should provide simulation training for life-threatening massive obstetric hemorrhage to the anesthesiologists, obstetricians, midwives, lab people, and the portraying staff. And a national massive obstetric hemorrhage poster should be adopted and personalized by each unit delivering the maternity care. This poster should be prominently displayed in the labor ward. So even if somebody is forgetting something, how to manage a postpartum hemorrhage, there should be something which should be in bold, available in the labor room to, you know, in emergency situation, you can just refer to that one. Okay, so prevention, this we nobody spoke about the delayed cord clamping. Okay, so uh, this can, you can follow this delayed cord clamping once you don't, if the baby is okay, if the baby is not like the EBGAR is not low and there is, there is no heavy bleeding. In cases of uh, hemorrhage or the baby EBGAR is low, please don't follow this delayed cord clamping, okay? Then prophylactic uterotonic should be administered to all women to prevent PPH. So prevent PPH means uh, mostly all of us are using oxytocin alone, although the guideline says that oxymetrine, which is a combination of two, it is uh, more, you know, useful to control the bleeding. But because of the methargen part, uh, there is more nausea, vomiting, and the risk of uh, patients having high blood pressure, it can uh, lead to problem. So you uh, mostly, it is 10-unit intramuscular oxytocin or 5-unit 
IV slow is the recommended dose. Okay. So just to make sure once you're talking to an examiner in this RCPI exam, remember the doses and the roots. They will be very, you know, particular about once you are saying oxytocin, you have to say, I will give oxytocin 10 units intramuscular or five units intravenous slowly. Then I will give 40 unit in the drip of 500 normal saline at the rate of 100 ml or 125 ml per hour. This is how you, you, you don't just say, I will give this, this, this. You have to specify the dose and what is the maximum dose? What is the root of that medication? Okay. For the um, carb, uh, this one, uh, Cytotec or the mesoprostol, uh, 800 to 1 gram you can give rectally and the sublingual dose is 600 okay oral dose is different sublingual dose is different so whatever route you are saying please specify the dose examiners in rcpi they are very particular about the drugs and their doses okay clear so far then uh, carbidocin or which is popularly known as pabal that is also in the list Transamic acid, you will give one gram IV stat that is given by the uh, anesthetist. Then this one, uh, papal or carbitocin, you can give uh, 250 microgram. Uh, sorry, this is 100 milligram. You can you'll give as a in the cesarean section. Normally, people are using carbitocin in this because I am working in UAE here. Instead of oxytocin, they're using carbitocin. So this is also one thing you can use to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, then physiological. Doctor, sorry, Doctor Osman, yeah. about yeah. carbitocin, how we can use it because we are not practicing, not available. But uh, carbitocin, how can we use it? It is IV, IV infusion or IV IV. IV stat, not in infusion. IV stat you will give. Okay. Okay, and since it is mentioned in the guidelines, so you have to mention it in your yeah. answer also. But what is contraindication? What is the contraindication for its use or not as oxytocin? No, no, there is, as, no, there is no such uh, contraindication. You can use it in patients with high blood pressure as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So oh, please mention this in the guide. Whatever is mentioned in the guideline, you have to talk about that thing. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, women who are requesting physiological management of third stage, please explain to them the risk of having bleeding. And the, if they still want to go with the physiological management, you have to support their decision, okay? And if, uh, but if by 30 minutes, uh, still the bleeding is excessive, then and the placenta is not separated, then you have to take some action, but keep the patient and the family involved in everything you are doing to the patient, okay? So how long you will wait for the removal of the placenta? 30 to 60 minutes after birth. Sooner if the patient is actively bleeding. If the patient is not bleeding, then it is 30 to 60 minutes. Okay, so they also, they want you to speak about this. They will ask you about that. How long will you wait for the placenta to come out? So you have to remember this 30 to 60 minutes. I know it is very basic. Most of us are following this every day and seeing this every day in our life. But once it comes to the exam, you know, out of anxiety, we forget things. So please organize yourself, practice it. It is a very easy station because this is something we see every day. So remember and just go through this guideline again. Okay. So yeah, we spoke about the transamic acid. It can be considered in the patient who are uh, actively bleeding or who are at risk of having a postpartum hemorrhage. Recognition, we already recognize. So multi uh yes estimation of the blood loss okay so it is better always to overestimate rather than underestimation because uh, if you claim uh, that the patient had a bleeding of 800 ml her pre-delivery hemoglobin was 12 and post-delivery hemoglobin comes out to be 9 so what do you think happened over here Anybody? So you mean anemia of the blood loss? So it's going to be collapsed no, 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 earlier. No, no, I said pre-delivery hemoglobin is 12. You documented that your blood loss is 900 ml and the post-delivery hemoglobin came out to be 9. So what do you think happened over here? 
So it's internal breathing for me. Uh huh. Yes, very right, Sajda. Underestimation. Okay. Okay. Because you mostly there, I've seen practically, I'm seeing that, okay, the hospital has made a protocol or a policy that you will raise an incident report if the blood loss is more than 1000 ml. Okay. So just to avoid the incident report, you make the blood loss 950, 900, 850. Right or wrong? Because subjective mostly, unless they measure the pad or I don't know how they measure it, but otherwise subjective. Every, every hospital has a different protocol, but mostly what happens that if even you are seeing that there is blood loss, of course, more than one liter, but you just to avoid the incident reporting and the later things you want to just put it at 900. So all this estimation of the blood loss is very, very important. Please do correct estimation. So you have to do uh, proper estimation. And then accordingly you manage. Okay. All right. Clear or no? Rule of 30. What is rule of 30? Anybody knows about rule of 30? Sorry, I am not aware. Can you open your mic and tell us about the rule of 30, please? Okay, I don't know. Anybody knows? They can enlighten us, please. Okay, all right. So a staged approach to the postpartum hemorrhage response is recommended with the escalation of the care depending on the uh, availability. Wait, just move this. Depending on the blood loss and the clinical concerns. Uh, the recommendation is that each maternity unit um, implement the policy documented pathway. We already spoke about that. Then standard components of the initial uterine attorney management should be available, uh, which is some number one is, uh, you know, the, we always talk about the four T's. So that is the tone, trauma, uh, tissue, and thromboplastin, okay? So tissue means thromboplastin, uh, any uh, re retained product of the conception or any tear, so four T's. So you have to start with the massage. You have to put a catheter and check for the completeness of the placenta. Okay, all right. What is this? Let's see. It is. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you're talking about this rule of 30. I thought something else you are talking about. Yes, you are very right. Thank you, Sajda. All right. Okay. Uh, so, a standard components like uterine tony should include a uterine massage. We already just spoke about it. Then oxytocin is recommended as the first line uh, treatment. Okay, either IV slow or as infusion is preferable. Uh, uh, normally, we give IM with normal delivery, 10 units IM and 5 unit IV slow. Okay, normally IV is given at the time of the cesarean section. Okay, ergometrine, as they said, uh, that because of the risk of... Uh, having more nausea, vomiting, they avoid the combination. Otherwise, it is also very powerful drug. And uh, methargen you always uh, can use in patients who are not hypertensive. Okay. Uh, as we are already talking about the local policy and the eutotonic use uh, in PPS management, uh, transamic acid, and then surgical intervention. Surgical intervention will be of the Becri balloon. So please remember that you can inflate up to 350 to 500 ml of warm normal saline in the Becri balloon. And you can keep it for 12 to 24 hours. You can uh, continue for 48 hours also. And you should cover the patient with antibiotic during that period. Okay. And it should be gradual decompensation to avoid again bleeding once you are about to remove the Bakery balloon. Okay. Then um, 
you have to uh, perform a stepwise ligation of the internal eyelid, uterine internal eyelid, and then final is the hysterectomy if the bleeding is not controlled to save patient's life. So any patient who is at risk of having a postpartum hemorrhage, so you should take another consent uh, in advance. What is that consent? Hmm? Yes, very good, Abir. You have to take the consent of hysterectomy, yes. Okay, so your management always starts with the two white bowl cannulas, which you will uh, insert, and you will start with the flu fluid. Crystalloid administration of less than 3.5 liters is uh, suggested if the hemorrhage is ongoing. That blood components, you will start with the RH negative blood if the group uh, cross match blood is not available. And once the blood arrives, you will uh, start using your uh, cross match blood. Okay. Platelet components you will use, uh, it should be given if the platelet count falls below 75, and uh, you should maintain it above 50. Okay. Uh, then plasma fibrinogen level should be more than 2 gram per liter. It should be maintained. If it is less than this, then you have to administer fibrinogen as well. So these all things, uh, fluid, how much fluid you will give and uh, what is the level of platelet you should maintain and how much plasma fibrinogen level you should be it should be there where you will administer fibrinogen. Please remember these. Okay. Then... Uh, they say that empirical early fibrinogen replacement may be considered if the fibrinogen level will take time to come, okay? So if you feel that patient needs fibrinogen, you can uh, send the level and then uh, give her fibrinogen as well. Then they are talking about uh, this uh, viscoelastic hemostatic assay. Uh, which is not rapidly available. So this is for the fibrinogen. Then cell salvage, if uh, you are working in a tertiary care unit, the uh, facility of cell salvage will be available in your hospital. A patient doesn't want to receive blood from any other person, so cell salvage should be done. And then what they say, that there is uh, no evidence which favors either general anesthesia or regional anesthesia in the management or in the operating room, okay? So if you have time, you can proceed. Suppose the patient had a normal vaginal delivery and she was not under epidural and she is now bleeding. So you can either give her a, a spinal anesthesia or a general anesthesia. So there is no difference between the two, okay? So this can also come up as a question, what you will do? Yeah, we are coming to the cryoprecipitate later, dear. Don't worry. Okay. So they call it as code red obstetrics, okay? So major obstetric hemorrhage protocol articulated as code red obstetrics should be activated for the uncontrolled bleeding, which is more than 1.5 liter, okay? Or if the clinical concern warrants it. Each maternity unit, they should adopt a nationally agreed term life-threatening hemorrhage code red obstetrics. So please remember this, uh, that, uh, if they ask you what code you would use in the case of massive hemorrhage, you will use code red massive hemorrhage, okay? All right, then clear communication pathways are recommended at, uh, to alert all the relevant team members and a designated person should coordinate further management. We all know about this SBAR, which is identification, situation, background, assessment, and recommendation technique, which is a simple way to plan and structure communication. So this also can be a question in the exam that how you will communicate with your colleagues. So you have to say the word, I will communicate using the ISBAR tool, which is identification, situation, background assessment, recommendation. Am I clear so far? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so, um, as I said, please keep your patients and their families involved in your management all the time. There should be a scribber who should be assigned to document uh, everything, uh, all the medicines which are given, what are the times of that medication, what up to what dose you have reached, okay, so that you can move to the next step. And the emergency should be stood down when bleeding is controlled or is appropriate. Stood down means what, suppose? 
you have ex, uh, ex, excal, escalated the situation as massive obstetric hemorrhage. You have activated the cord, but now the things are uh, under control. So you have to de-escalate the situation. Okay, clear? <coughs> so post-event, what you will do after uh, this event has finished? So restrictive transfusion policy, that is you will only transfuse once the hemoglobin is less than seven. Okay, if the woman is uh, stable. Okay, so remember this, when you will transfuse uh, after a postpartum hemorrhage, you will repeat the CBC if it is less than seven and the patient is stable. Uh, patient, uh, sorry, if the HB is less than seven, then the patient needs transfusion. But if the patient, uh, HB says it is more than seven and still the patient is unstable, then you can transfuse, okay? Otherwise, in a stable patient, seven is the uh, your line where you have to transfuse for the transfusions, okay? Then you have to assess her for the risk of venous thromboembolism. And uh, uh, if you feel that, patient needs a prophylaxis, then you have to start the prophylaxis. Please remember these words, the I will assess her for the need of thromboprophylaxis and these multidisciplinary team discussions. These words they want to hear from your mouth once you are giving exam. Okay, and then as we spoke about there are in RCOG, we call it a dead text, debrief, document, and duty of candor. That is, dead text is the incident reporting. Documentation is your documentation. Each and everything you will document. Debrief is to the family and the patient. And duty of candor means if something has gone wrong and you have you are the one or the hospital made a mistake, you have to be honest and you know apologize to the patient that this has been done. Okay, remember uh, clear so far. Okay, so uh, as we said that debriefing should be immediate also and not only to the patient, but also to the staff who are involved in the care of the patient. So the team debriefment and debriefing the patient and the family upon discharge and then six weeks later at the postnatal visit also, she needs to be brief debriefed. Why you think this is important to brief the, uh, debrief the patient and document? Anybody? I think for me to call legal reason and also for prevention or uh, take steps in subsequent pregnancy. Exactly. Very good. So in the subsequent pregnancy, uh, it is very, very important. Yes, it is post-trauma also. Plus, it is uh, the next pregnancy that, you know, uh, once she is going, suppose she will not come to you in the next pregnancy. She will go to another uh, doctor or she is not in the same country. So she should tell uh, to the treating doctor what happened in her previous pregnancy so that they are vigilant in her management in the current pregnancy. Okay, so documentation and completion of component traceability should be carried out if it is not completed at the same time. Then massive obstetric hemorrhage should be reported through the hospital as we spoke, incident reporting. Then serious adverse events and serious adverse reaction associated with the transfusion or life-threatening hemorrhage should be reported to the National Hemovigilance Office, okay? So please remember in uh, Ireland, you have to report anything which led to a uh, life-threatening situation. Uh, such an hemorrhage should be reported to the National Hemovigilance Office, okay? Then audit, of course, audit is very, very important. Each maternity unit should have processes in place for auditing clinical practice and an agreed data set providing feedback to the team members. Cases of the massive obstetric hemorrhage, they should be reviewed at the serious incident management team meetings or similar type of meetings, the hospital transfusion committees and overarching transfusion committees to evaluate the effectiveness of the care treatment and services which are provided by the hospital. Okay, clear? All right, so this is our algorithm. As we, uh, you can say this, this is in one picture, whatever we spoke about so far, uh, that is uh, all women antenatally and interpartum, you have to check the presence of the risk, uh, then complete and document the risk assessment. Act means consent. You obtain the consent if the patient is uh, ready to receive blood or no. The blood should be available, group uh, cross-match. 
and there's ensure that there is IV excess and then treat the third stage of labor actively, okay? Then if it is more than 500 ml in a normal vaginal delivery, so what you will do, you will call for help. You will uh, summon the uh, senior staff. You will record the observation. Please, once you are talking to the uh, examiner, speak, you know, talk in that uh, this uh, manner. Don't just start with the, I will do this cannula and this and that. You have to put cannula, but you have to check for the vital signs. So first thing you will say that I want to know the vital signs of the patient, okay? So record observation, blood pressure, heart rate, and interventions, what are already done, and then you will take on from there onwards, okay? Assessment of the blood loss, IV excess with a large board cannula, if the blood is already sent or not sent. Then you inspect if there is any tear and check the placenta if it is complete and assign, assign someone to write everything that is scribble. And treat, you start with the massage, you give eutrotonics, you empty the bladder. And by that time, you already know what is the cause of the bleeding, okay? So if it is more than 1,000 ml or there's a clinical concern, patient is collapsing, then you have to call more senior staff, okay? Uh, then you have to put... Uh, this is here they are saying you just put one IV cannula that is for just 500 to 1000. Okay. Here, what they are saying is more than 1000 ml, you have to put two IV. Second IV, you have to insert over here. If it is a massive hemorrhage, it is going uh, above one liter. Okay. So then you will send the blood for a full blood count, coagulation, fibrinogen level, and the blood gases you will do. You will inform the lab and you will start with the transfusion, review eutrotonics, whatever is given. Maybe it's not enough, so you have to go to the next level. Transfuse if there is a need. A catheter you already inserted. You have to inspect the genitalia for any trauma, tear, which is not uh, obvious. So maybe you need to take the patient to OT and examine her under anesthesia. Okay. More than 1500 ml, what they're saying, you have to communicate current measured blood loss to the team. Now, this is massive obstetric hemorrhage, more than 1.5 liter. So you have to activate the code and activate the hemorrhage protocol, okay? Then post-event, what they're saying, uh, complete post-event checks. We already discussed that. Inform, debrief the patient and the family, debrief the team, document everything, and raise the incident report, okay? All right, so this is the form they are using in Ireland. So please go through this form. It says that what was the recent hemoglobin, what was the platelet, and what is the date, okay? So uh, MRN is the medical record number of the patient, and then hemoglobin platelet and the date. Then <clears throat> what did you do? Uh, stage zero PPH risk assessment complete for all women on admission, including lower segment cesarean section and the patient who's coming for labor, okay? So... Uh, you check if the placenta is complete or not complete. So retain product of conception. Was the labor induced or augmented? Is there any uh, history of placenta previa, accretia, or there was some abruption in the antenatal period? Is the patient is having chorioamnionitis? Then labor and delivery makes an ongoing assessment of the following risk factors throughout the labor and delivery. That is, you assess the patient for any fever in labor, if the labor is prolonged, more than 12 hours. If the second stage is prolonged, more than four, uh, four hours. So please remember this first stage, 12 hours is prolonged. And second stage, more than four hours is prolonged. Or syntocinone is going on for long, more than 12 hours. So these all increase the risk of having a postpartum hemorrhage. And if it is a emergency cesarean section, that time also there is increased risk of a postpartum bleeding. If the baby is good size baby, more than 4.5 kg. What is ACT? ACT is you uh, have a, a, a blood group a cross match in your hand. Uh, you have IV access and you also have the consent uh, for the blood transfusion. Treat is according uh, to the case, of course, active management of the third stage of labor. Then according to the blood loss, you manage the atonia and other things. Okay. Help is more than 500 ml. You have to call the midwife or the obstetrician. Okay, obstetrician is you. Uh, suppose uh, they are talking about this is a general guideline for everyone. So they are normally in um, th that part of the word midwives are the one who are conducting deliveries. 
so uh, in that case you have to inform a senior midwife or in or the duty doctor they have to inform assign a scribber measure the blood loss record the observation have a iv access with a large bore cannula and send the blood for uh, cross match and other labs you have to check for the placenta and these all things we already know okay so just this is a recap of what we spoke about this is also same which we said but please go through this again. Okay, and this is the poster they're talking about to keep it in the labor room. Okay. Clear so far? All right. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. Four T's, tone, tissue, trauma, thrombin, uterine massage, and um, you have to after uterotonics you have to patient to uh, you move the patient to the theater for examination and anesthesia plus minus you have to i do either do a, a balloon tamponade for her or a bill in suture or you have to uh, nobody spoke about the interventional radiology please yes if the patient is a known case of placenta previa then you have to have the interventional radiologist involved in the care of that patient okay so another new guideline came about the management of placenta accreta maybe we will do it in another webinar sometime okay so that is also one thing you have to mention okay so this one you missed uh um, about the interventional radiology, okay? So that okay. interventional uh, radiology in emergency or it's elective. I don't, I don't understand interventional. It, there it should be radiologist, right? Right. It is a, yeah, yeah, it is a radiologist. So it is mostly in the cases of placenta previa major, a known case uh, with there where there's a risk of bleeding. So in that scenario, you have to involve the interventional radiologist. They will put the uh, catheter balloon in the uterine artery before the surgery itself, okay? They will not inflate them. They will only inflate them if they you experience a heavy bleeding, okay? In cases of emergency, of course, uh, it is not possible, but you will just mention that a patient who are at risk of having bleeding, we can involve the interventional radiologist in their care. Okay, this is what they want to hear from your mouth. Yeah, okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. So any questions so far about today's topic? Or about the exam? Nobody want to ask anything. What is this? <laughs> You're welcome, Abir. All right, you see that in MRCPI exam, what happens is uh, uh, it depends on the examiner. But normally, if it is a case-based discussion, and most of the stations are case-based discussions, so they are very, you know, particular about, as I said, drugs, their roots, their side effects. So please uh, prepare your topic very well. Okay, so go through the guideline. Again, there are multiple new guidelines which came in 2022 and 2023. So, sorry, madam, we get this new PPH, LEC, what is LEC? Lecture, uh, okay. This is all the guideline which is on the website. Don't worry about it. Okay, Ram? And I think you can get this uh, recording also. Yeah, it is the latest guideline 2023. And then 2022, uh, there's uh, Akrita as well this year. And then 2022, there were some uh, guidelines about the Eurogyne. So maybe we will cover them in another webinar. And regarding our course, uh, we are doing a course uh, which will have uh, six to seven sessions. Uh, we cover seven to eight stations and topics in uh, our session. And we do two long cases each session. And then we do five uh, short cases like OSCEs in that session. All are from the previous exam. So in our course, we almost cover about 70, 60 to 70 topics from the previous exams, okay? And as I said so earlier, Alhamdulillah, we have a success rate of 100%. None of our candidates, they failed the exam who took the uh, session with us. 
it is of course their hard work but we prepared them also for the exam and uh, yeah uh, in between we have a, a dedicated whatsapp group or a group on the telegram where we will be doing the extra stations which are you know which can come and can we cannot cover them in this session so this is about our course uh how many uh, archive guidelines my dear don't go for the archive guidelines if there is no latest guideline for the rcpi please follow the rcog okay uh, because uh, they also follow the examiner who is sitting in front of you they also expect you to speak of the latest things so talk of rcog if you don't have any rcpi latest guideline on that topic okay okay sunanda Twenty twenty, I did not see any guideline. Okay, uh, but uh, nice guideline is there, so we can follow the nice guideline. I will uh, all the new guidelines they came in twenty twenty two, and then this twenty twenty three. Before that, there was no new guideline. There was some uh, draft for it. I will go through and uh, I'll get back to you. Okay, Sunanda. All right. So any questions so far? If no question, then we will conclude our today's session. Okay, and thank you everyone for uh, attending the session uh, and being here with us. And uh, we will be doing more free webinars in future. If you are interested to join our course, please contact our team, uh, they are available. Okay, thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, bye.